We organize the analysis of military operations, of the production of victory and the outcome of defeat through the principles of war. Here on the left, you can see the battlefield of Talens, which was the oldest battlefield in Northern Europe involving more than a thousand soldiers. And it's thought to have occurred around 1200 BCE. It's thought to have involved 5,000 soldiers, which were organized over great distances. On the right, you can see the oldest depiction of humans hunting each other, in effect, fighting each other in a war. And this is from a cave painting in Spain, 20,000 BC. So humans have been involved in the interaction of organized violence for a very long time. So political context matters in all warfare. Military activity can be analyzed from three distinct levels of analysis. These are roughly arbitrary, but they coincide with certain technical definitions. The highest level is the strategic. This is concerned with the balancing of political goals and military resources. In effect, if you're not seeking to obtain as much as your resources allow you, you're wasting your strength. On the other hand, if you're seeking goals that are defended by parties that are stronger than you, you're very likely to be defeated. Karl von Clausewitz, a theorist of war who wrote the book Der Krieg, or On War, in 1832, explains War is policy by other means. In other words, while war is theoretically an absolute and unlimited contest between opposing military forces, it is, however, mediated by political goals. In other words, the soldiers are paid and the weapons are bought by citizens or by a leader. And these citizens and a leader have a political goal. So people don't fight wars arbitrarily. They fight it for a purpose. And those purposes are defined by politics. The reason it's defined by politics is that war is very expensive, enormously expensive. And whether the money is borrowed or raised through taxes, it's a heavy burden. Because of this political mediation, we don't have endless wars. Wars are not absolute. They're rarely fought to the death. Wars are begun for political goals, and wars are ended when the political goal is judged too expensive or it's been achieved. Now, be aware, be aware wars can in turn alter goals meaning that you have an initial war policy about what the goal is, and in the process of the fighting, you widen your goals, perhaps because of enormous losses and anger in the population and a desire for vengeance, the goal transfers from conquering a small piece of territory to capturing a much bigger piece of territory. Or, once a war begins, it's discovered that the enemy is much stronger than initially thought, and the goals are then reduced significantly. Here you can see a map of the Japanese area that was conquered in 1941, at the beginning of the Second World War, and the arrows are the American advance across the Pacific against Japan. Japan's goal was to seize control of China and of Southeast Asia to provide resources, and the Pacific Islands as a barrier against the U.S. advance and then to negotiate for peace. The second level is the operational. This conceptually focuses on formations at a level at which weapon deployments and ranges are abstracted. So we're not looking here at weapons ranges. The level at which maneuver is the key means of achieving victory is analyzed at the operational level. So at this level, we're interested in outflanking and encirclements and rapid breakthroughs. Here, the unit sizes are typically thousands of soldiers and more. 
You can see here on the right a map of the German June 22nd, 1941 invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa, in which the Germans used their superior mobility to encircle large groups of Soviet forces and to take them as prisoner. The third and lowest level of military analysis is the level of the tactical. This is concerned with the territorial deployment of weapons. Here unit sizes are typically hundreds of soldiers and less. Here you can see a mosaic of Alexander the Great on the left facing off against the Persian leader Darius in his chariot on the right. And this is at the Battle of Issus. And here the tactics consisted of mobile Macedonian cavalry and large Greek phalanxes and light soldiers, peltasts, and archers and slingers and chariot forces. And the tactics involved how to maneuver these forces in a coordinated fashion so they supported each other. The principles of war are in fact variables that we use to measure the conduct of warfare. In terms of commanding military forces, the most important principle at all levels is the first principle of war, and that is the selection and the maintenance of the aim. Now, war is a lethal enterprise pervaded by fear and uncertainty, and this leads, therefore, to friction. It is the essential concept that distinguishes war on paper, or planning, from real war. Friction captures the idea that there is always this pressure that takes away from the perfect plan, the perfect timetable and reduces it to confusion. For Karl von Clausewitz in chapter 7, book 1 of Der Krieg on war, quote, everything in war is simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. War involves the infliction of death. And here we have a shocking depiction of Canadian soldiers being killed by a German machine gun. The reason we emphasize the first principle of war, the selection and the maintenance of the aim, is because of two dysfunctions. The first, which often has its origins in the political process, is that a leader will be given two aims that contradict each other. For example, a commander could be told to pacify a country and at the same time to rebuild it. And so you can imagine that the commander doesn't know whether they should garrison the country or whether they should cooperate with the local population to get involved in reconstruction. So when you have two aims, very often politically you have one official aim and then you've got pressure for another aim, then it leads to confusion and wastes of resources that ultimately leads to neither aim being selected. A second dysfunction is simply confusion. The leader and their subordinates don't know what they're supposed to do. And so resources, when they should be focused on a given goal, are in fact distracted to other missions. And this is a big danger very often in military operations where the aim is forgotten and it transforms over time and it becomes something else. So while it seems very, very obvious in a military operation, it is always important for the leader to specify an end state. What does victory look like? And then to move towards that goal 
without distraction. Now, obviously, a goal like victory has many moving parts. And so it's not simple. It is, in reality, complex. But all of these moving parts have to be coordinated and synchronized so they're all aiming at the same final goal. One solution to handling the friction in war is simplicity in planning, which is an element of the first principle of war. Complex plans will be impossible to implement in the chaos of conflict. Command is easiest when reliable means of communications are available and the available friendly and enemy forces are in small numbers. So the order of difficulty in coordinating forces is easiest to hardest from the Navy, where there's just a few ships, to the Air Force, where there's maybe 100 or 200 aircraft, and then the Army, where there are thousands of independent units. The Army has the largest number of distinct subordinate entities. Navies have the least in the form of a much smaller number of ships, submarines, and aircraft. Now this affects the feasibility of the centralization of command. So in the Navy you have the highest ease of command, and in the Army the lowest ease of command. The goal of battle is to achieve victory against the adversary. In other words, to win. This is done according to Karl von Clausewitz, by destroying your opponent's military forces and preserving your own. The key and the second principle of war is achieving the concentration of force against your opponent's weakness and denying the same to your enemy. The concentration of force is also called the principle of massing forces, or mass. The opponent's weakness is normally referred to as the center of gravity. This is the most important principle of combat, and it is the core of the military profession to achieve this concentration of force. Specifically, at the point of attack, or the point of the main effort, which in German is called the Schwerpunkt, you always want to maximize the concentration of your force against the weakness of the enemy. The greater the difference in strength between the attacker and the defender, the greater exponentially is the difference between the losses of the stronger and the weaker side. All other principles of war are subordinated to this one, in the sense that the other principles are meant to enhance the leader's ability to achieve a concentration of force and to deny the same to the enemy. In this course, we will be playing simulations, and players will be confronted with the dilemmas and the choices to achieve a concentration of force. So the constant, achieving the concentration of force is the key professional mission of the battlefield commander. Here you can see a British SAS officer deployed in Saba in 1964. Now we use the Lanchester Square Law to model the concentration of force. Lanchester was a mathematician who helped develop these equations. Now the mathematical relationship in warfare is unique and is captured by these equations, particularly the square law version of these equations. And they're written about a century ago, uh, shortly after uh, Lanchester's equation uh, as a stretcher bearer in an ambulance uh, in the trenches of the First World War. And it essentially explains how, how firepower creates victory. The essential verbal description is that the greater the firepower superiority of Army A over Army B, the greater the exponential, or specifically the inverse hyperbolic tan, difference in their battle losses. 
Now, the basic logic of the Lanchester equation is that there is an exponential increase in the ratio of, of the firepower as there is an arithmetic increase in the ratio of the units that are firing at each other. And its peculiar consequence is a wildly disproportionate infliction of losses that creates different loss curves until one or the other side is terminated. And this applies to nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons are basically bullets being fired at targets. And so uh, I'm going to show you now the precise logic and the precise math behind it. And once you've looked at that, I'm then going to show you the, the uh, impact of the application of that logic. The second most important principle of war is the concentration of force, also called mass. This has been identified by authors as diverse as Sun Tzu, Karl von Clausewitz, Yamini, Napoleon, U.S. Operations Manual FM 500, the Prussian Military Command. It has a special characteristic. Here you can see a display of four soldiers encountering two soldiers on the other side. And we think about the power ratio. Well, we have four soldiers and they're confronting two soldiers. So we could divide four by two and we could see that there's a power ratio here of two to one. So if there was to be an exchange, maybe two of the four soldiers that are here would die and they would exchange their lives for the two soldiers that are opposing them. But let's take a deeper look at what the actual ratio is. In a given unit of time, each soldier will be able to fire one bullet. Now the four soldiers on the left will be able to concentrate their fire. So these two soldiers will concentrate their fire here. And these two soldiers will concentrate their fire here. The soldiers that are responding, the two smaller, the, sol two, the, group, the smaller group of two soldiers will respond, but they'll have to divide their bullets in half because they have two targets, not one. So they're going to be firing back half a bullet each against each of the targets. Half. Now what governs the ratio is not the total number of soldiers, it's the ratio of the firepower between each of the soldiers. Each of the soldiers on the left is receiving half a bullet. Each of the soldiers on the right are receiving two bullets. That is the real ratio. What is the ratio of half to two? That's the ratio of one to four. That means when you have a numerical advantage that's twice, your firepower advantage is actually four times. This is the first property of the concentration of force. It has huge political consequences. Military leaders are trained very early on to show up as quickly as possible with as much as possible so at the point of contact they are not outnumbered. It doesn't mean soldiers like war. It means soldiers dislike defeat. Let's take this to a more extreme level. This is the second characteristic of the concentration of force. We're going to reduce the group of two soldiers on the right to one soldier. They encounter each other inside a forest. Here you have a nominal numerical ratio of four to one, four soldiers to one soldier. But again, let's count the exchange in terms of firepower. We have four soldiers firing on one soldier, 
So four bullets are coming in. This soldier is firing a quarter bullet at each target. A quarter to four is a ratio of 16 to one. So this is the second property of the concentration of force. As the ratio increases ar arithmetically, the ratio of firepower increases geometrically. So there is severe punishment, a disproportionate set of losses suffered by the weaker party. The equations that model this relationship are called the Lanchester equation, and they reveal specifically that there is an inverse hyperbolic tan increase in losses as the ratio of forces increases. Now the Lanchester equations are used to model a particular phenomenon that's been observed in warfare and that is that you don't have a proportionate set of losses between sides. You actually have a losses that are uh, cumulatively disproportional. And the actual loss rate is the inverse hyperbolic tan. And this is crucial because it's actually counterintuitive and it has a whole bunch of both military and political consequences. So it's important to know how the Lanchester equations function. So the way that we're going to approach it is we're going to look at it in three different steps. Okay, and these are consistent with the assignments you're going to have to do. So the Lanchester equations have a first part, and the first part uh, is intended to determine which is the stronger side. This is important because in the equations you have two sides. You've got red and blue, and red designates the stronger side at all time. So the first goal is to identify which side is the stronger. So to determine the greater force, we have this formula here. It's going to be small r times big R at time zero. So zero doesn't mean zero quantity. It means at the beginning, at time zero. So you take the initial force, and you then compare that to small b times big B squared, also at time zero. Now it doesn't matter at this stage which uh, uh, force is given which color. Uh, the important uh, element here is that once you've done the calculation, the larger force, the larger net force, is given the identity of red in the second and the third equation. So here we've got 0 0.01 for both small r and small b. These are uh, efficiency uh, coefficients. And then we multiply by the number of combat units. In this case, for the arbitrary red, we've got 200. For the uh, arbitrary b or blue, we've got 150. So it's 0 0.01 times 200 uh, squared versus 0 0.01 times 150 squared. And when you calculate it out, we end up with 400 versus 225, and 400 is the larger value. So these values that are red uh, will continue to be red in the remaining two equations. Now the second equation answers the question, how many soldiers, um, uh, when they're fighting, how many turns will the battle take? Okay, so it's battle end. When will the battle end? This is the most complicated of the equations and the ones that students have the most difficulty with. Essentially, it's about how to apply the inverse hyperbolic tan. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, but let's look at the uh, formula first, or the equation. It's going to be small r times small b. And remember now, r here is the identity of the larger, stronger force. Not necessarily the larger force, but the stronger force. So here we have the two efficiency coefficients. They're multiplied against each other. You take the square root, and then you get the reciprocal. Basically, you put, put a 1 on top. Times the inverse hyperbolic tan of, and here we see BO and RO again. And these are values at the initial strengths when the battle begins. So we take B's initial strength, and which we know to be 150, and R's initial strength of 200. And then we multiply it by the square root of the b's coefficient of efficiency by r's coefficient of efficiency. So now we can insert the values. Small r and small, small b, in this case, are both 0 0.01. We put them in here, multiply them uh, against each other. We take the square root, 
Uh, and then we have the reciprocal, um, uh, basically all under uh, numerator of 1. Now, if we calculate that out, it's basic arithmetic. You can use a calculator on your cell phone or your computer. You end up with 100. Now, here we've got the predicate of the trigonometric function. So we've got b at time 0 over r times 0 times b over r. So it's 150 over 200 times the square root of 0 0.1 over 0 0.1. That's obviously 1. The square root of 1 is 1. So this whole element here uh, turns into 1 and disappears. And we have 150 divided by 200, which is 0.75. So here we arrive at the problem. 0.75 is the predicate of the inverse hyperbolic tan, which means we apply the inverse hyperbolic tan to 0.75. Do not try to apply it uh, to the number in front of it, which is the 100. Whatever this calculation is, we then multiply the value you know, by 100. So the inverse hyperbolic tan of 0.75 is going to be 0.9729. And then we multiply that by 100, and that gives us 97.29. So this engagement is going to go through 97 turns, at the end of which the weaker party, in this case blue, will be completely annihilated, and some unknown number of red will still be around. So that's what this, the second equation here does. So let's go on now to the third equation. The third equation answers the final crucial question, how much of red force will survive on the last turn of this engagement when blue is completely annihilated? So what is the strength of the victor at the end? R end. So the formula here is R at time 0 times the square root of 1 minus, and the numerator is the uh, B's uh, efficiency coefficient, times B squared uh, at time 0. So the total number of forces times itself, divided by small r, the small r coefficient of efficiency, times the big r squared of units at time 0. And if we plug in the values, it's going to be 200, which is the number of forces of red, square root 1 minus 0 .01, 0 0.01 times 150 squared, divided by 0 0.01 times 200 squared. That's going to give us 225 over 400, 1 minus that value. And you can uh, sort of relatively simply calculate this out as a couple of more steps. And we end up with a value of the forces of red at the end of 97 turns of engagement will be 132.28 soldiers. And the number of blue soldiers at the end will be zero at the conclusion of the battle at the end of turn 97. So here is the math that I used uh, just previously, in case you want to see it in uh, a clearer format. There we have China's LOP NOR nuclear detonation in uh, Xinjiang uh, province, which is their um, uh, region, which is populated by the Uyghurs. And uh, this was China's first uh, nuclear test. Here you can see uh, more of the uh, equations and you can see a missile launch. Here is the third and final Lanchester equation, and here you see a Tupolev 95 bomber. I visited NORAD headquarters in Cheyenne Mountain, which is very interesting because it's a joint command for North American defense, uh, operated both by Canadians and Americans, and so it's familiar there. It's nice to see familiar faces, familiar uniforms, the Canadian soldier. Now, during 9-11, the deputy commander who was in charge at the site, because the commander was elsewhere, was General Penny, a Canadian general. And when he heard of the strikes on the buildings, he immediately closed the door on the site. And he um, put out the requirement that all civil aircraft land. And that's the reason why the civilian air aircraft landed. He wanted to get control of the aircraft. But the original design of that command which is sent out from NORAD, as well as another site at DESMAC, is that uh, in order to clear the airspace to facilitate the launching of nuclear bombers, nuclear tankers that, that give them um, range, uh, and nuclear missiles, and to detect incoming missiles, all civilian aircraft had to land. And so we had a Canadian in charge. Now, when I went to, to see him at NORAD, I asked him, do we still have Russian aircraft flying? Um, 
And he said yes. He said, in fact, it's routine for the Russians to fly Tupolev-95 strategic bombers. And this is the Tupolev-95. Not very fast, those are turboprops, but it has incredible range. And even though it's a very old aircraft from the 1950s, um, because of its range, it's still being used. It could, it could virtually fly around the world. And so it can carry powerful sensors instead of bombs, which is what these versions do when they fly off the Canadian coast, even today. So now let's apply these in four simulations. We're going to run four models. I'm going to show you the inputs and the outputs. In the first, we're going to run two sides that are approximately equal. One, one outnumbers the other side. Then we're going to look at two forces that have a very small initial difference. Then we're going to look at a side in which one side is very uh, significantly advantaged over the other. And then we're going to look at another side where a weaker party has a higher effectiveness rate and is attacking a stronger party with a lower effectiveness rate. Here you can see a sea-launched cruise missile, which is bursting out of the water uh, after having been launched by a submarine. Any submarine can launch these, virtually any, and they're launched from the torpedo tubes. You don't need vertical silos. So here's our first simulation. We imagine 200 Reds. It could be ships, soldiers, rockets, artillery, airplanes, tanks, and they're fighting 150 Blues. Now in this particular simulation, their effectiveness is held constant. It's the same between each other. It's 0 0.01. So let's run the simulation. Red starts at 200, blue starts at 150, and notice that as blue suffers more and more, the curve that red is suffering slows down. So blue ultimately goes to annihilation. They're wiped out. Red still has 132 soldiers. So you see that a 25% difference allows two thirds of red to survive. That is very disproportionate. So this captures the consequence of the Lanchester Square Law. Uh, it's fairly profound. It tells us a small difference like 25% is going to create a huge, enormous outcome. In the second simulation, we're going to run a much tighter difference between the two parties. And this, I think, really captures most vividly the impact of the Lanchester equation on a combat interaction. Again, we've kept effectiveness constant between both parties. We have 200 reds against 190 blues. And in terms of performance, the individual units are equally efficient. See, a tiny difference at the initial point, and over time, blue goes to annihilation, but red still has about a third of their units survive. 62 units survive. So the tiniest differences can create enormous consequential outcomes at the end. In our third simulation, just, just so we can see what it would look like, we're going to run 200 against uh, red against 100 blue. Again, the effectiveness is constant. And here we can see 173 of the 200 red survive, and blue again is annihilated almost in a straight line. So uh, showing up with half as many of anything on a battlefield uh, without having some other advantage like maneuver or training of the soldiers or firepower or geography will lead to this terrible outcome. This is why soldiers hate to show up late with not enough stuff and why initiative matters because they want to be able to maneuver and hit the opponent's weakness before the opponents hits their own weakness. So let's run the fourth simulation. Here we're going to have a weaker party, red, attack a stronger party, blue. And when I mean stronger and weaker, I don't mean in the Lanchester sense. I mean it in the, the sense of the number of units that are attacking. But red will have twice the effectiveness, 0 0.04. So here we see red still prevailing, blue being brought to annihilation. And you've got about 7,900 of red that survive. So all of these indicate, using different values, the significant impact of the Lanchester equations. So what are some of the observations? Well, we have decelerating loss rates for both sides. Now this is if you had robots fighting each other or, you know, rockets. But in reality, humans, when they fight, they have breakpoints. They have a sense that defeat is coming and then some of them run away. 
Now in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was observed that the highest losses occurred when one side ran away. It sounds very peculiar, but in early battles involving melee weapons like swords and spears, uh, it was more like a brawl. It was like a rugby game. People pushing back and forth. People got injured, but they got injured a lot. And you can get stabbed quite a few times before you actually die or, or slashed or hit with a, with a mace or a hammer or an axe. But when people get scared and they turn around and they run away, they expose their back. They're no longer working in a unit with other people, but they're isolated. And they're running in a direction they're not sure where. They're very often lost because there's no one telling them what to do. And most of the losses, we're talking over half of all the losses in, in many of the great battles over the last thousands of years, uh, including the era of firearms in the 18th and 19th centuries were lost when, when people were running away. So breakpoints are important for other reasons. If you can push someone to a breakpoint because they're losing the Lanchester fight and they run away, that's when you get all the losses. The second observation is that there's a disproportionate increase in the difference of losses between the two sides based on the difference in their, in their initial military strength. So the initial military strength matters a lot. The Lanchester Equation is the core of every operations research model that examines combat. Now in the pictures we can see a frog, a free rocket over ground, which is a trucked uh, Soviet missile, which was uh, the initial version of it was called a uh, lunar rocket. And the other system we can see is a nuclear warhead being carried uh, inside what I believe is uh, F-111. Why are we going to Greece? Because the Lanchester equation was identified thousands of years ago. There was a re revolt by the Thebans against Sparta. Uh, Thebes, you can see in the center map, it's a slightly northeast uh, of, uh, rather northwest of Athens in, the, in Boeotia. And uh, it was basically a city surrounded by farms. They had a smaller population than Sparta. They had almost no military tradition to speak of. So their uh, farmers were much uh, less well trained. Uh, they had fewer weapons than the Spartans, but they had a leader, Epaminondas, who understood intuitively the Lanchester equations. So General Epaminondas confronted the Spartans at the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BC, before the Common Era. He was outnumbered and he was qualitatively inferior, but he knew about a practice of the oblique order, which was done quite often. The Greeks fought in phalanxes, which were large concentrations of soldiers with spears that were very long. Again, like a rugby game, big, thick, packed masses of soldiers who would then push against each other. And what he did was, if you look, look at this display, on the top of the map, you've got your uh, Spartans and your Spartan allies, Phocians, Phalasians, Corinthians. At the bottom of the map, you've got the Thebans, along with some of their rural allies, like the Boeotians. So Epaminondas took the Boeotians and had them lay at an angle, and he had the, the ranks very thin. And the land was sort of undulated. And he told the Boeotians, I want you to march, but I want you to march at an angle slow enough that you never get to the uh, Spartans. Sort of a Zeno's arrow paradox, right? Where you, before you can get someplace, you gotta go halfway, and before you can get halfway to there, you gotta get halfway to there, and it goes on infinitely. And although the that particular uh, paradox has been solved, it wasn't solved for the Boeotians because they actually never did successfully make contact in combat. They basically just sort of floated in front of the Spartan army and their allies to keep them occupied. And because of relatively flat terrain, the Spartans didn't think the formations were so shallow, they thought they were much thicker. So what Epaminondas did was he took the rest of his army and stuck it in a giant block on the left, which you can see. And he marched that giant block forward. And when that block impacted, it hit the Spartans head on. Now, the Spartans were more skilled. They had a higher effectiveness. But at the point of contact, the Thebans and their allies had sufficient superiority quantitatively that it compensated for their lack of quality. So he leveraged, Epaminondas leveraged the insight of the Lanchester equations to create a concentration of force at the decisive point. And the impact was the Thebans won locally. 
And once they won locally, they were able to burst through the Spartans. And guess what? All the Spartan allies deserted and ran away. This was the battle where the Spartans, probably the best individual warriors that history has ever seen, were defeated on the battlefield by farmers led by a man who knew math. The results were the Spartan leader, Cleombrotus, was killed. The Spartans retreated. They lost 2,000 men. Their hegemony ended forever. The oblique order, as a technique to achieve a localized concentration of force, was identified consciously and used by Alexander the Great repeatedly. The Battle of Granicus, the Battle of Isis, and the Battle of the Plains of Arbela, or the Great Battle of Gagamela, that ultimately destroyed the Persian Empire. Frederick II of Prussia used it, and many others. The Lanchester equations have been reduced to a battlefield rule of thumb, which have, has applied since the age of firearms, and that is the three to one rule. The idea that for an attack to be successful, the firepower or the numbers of attackers must outnumber the defender by at least three to one for there to be a reasonable chance of success in the attack. Empirical evidence has found that this number varies wildly depending on a lot of circumstances. For example, you typically would want a 7 to 1 ratio if you were engaged in mountain warfare because the defenders have such a wide open space against which to uh, attack approaching attackers that uh, the defensive position is very, very strong. The 3 to 1 rule typically applies at the tactical level of warfare, when you've got a few hundred or a few thousand soldiers. At the operational level of warfare, you have much lower levels of advantage that permits an attacker to advance. So you don't need a 3 to 1 rule when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of soldiers and large maneuvering formations. Uh, you could probably advance with an advantage of just 1.2 or 1.3. Now tactically there's a point of diminishing returns where when you add additional soldiers to a battlefield there's just no space for them. There's no cover for their weapons and they disproportionately expose themselves to fire from the defenders and so it no longer becomes worthwhile to deploy them. On the, um, on the battlefield. So there's a lot of mediating factors that deviate from the three to one rule. We think historiographically that the three to one rule was expressed by American General Grant during the Civil War uh, in his explanation to the American President Lincoln about how he was conducting his operations. But it's become a fairly universal uh, rough measure on the advantage required on the tactical level in order to uh, be able to take the position.